This week in Coronavirus, Life After Lockdown, we're discussing what role artificial intelligence has played in our response to COVID-19 and how it could shape our lives beyond the pandemic. In simple terms, AI is a way of using smart machines to process vast amounts of data in a way that requires less human intervention. Let's show you an example of how AI has been employed during the crisis. After identifying the outbreak in Wuhan, Canadian company Blue Dot gathered data on people's movements based on their mobile phone use, which is what you're seeing right now. This was combined with other information, including flight ticket data, to predict the subsequent spread of the virus. I'm joined now by Dr. Cameron Khan in Toronto, an infectious disease physician and CEO of Blue Dot. Maya Negadron is an intensive care doctor here in London who has published research on AI and medicine. And Tabitha Goldstab is chair of the UK government's AI council, as well as running an international AI festival. Lovely to have all of you with us. Cameron, can I start with you and that amazing graphic that we've just seen? How was it that moment that you spotted the outbreak in Wuhan and you realized, I'm sure, that there were parallels with SARS? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for having me on this show. And, um, you know, this was on the morning of December 31st. Uh, we had actually been at Blue Dot, have been building what we call a digital early warning system for infectious diseases for the last six and a half years. Um, and we've been using artificial intelligence to extend our ability to pick up news of outbreaks at the earliest moment possible. You know, what we learned during the SARS outbreak, uh, which is where I started my career here in Toronto, just before SARS hit back in 2003, was that if we wait for official reports from government health agencies, we may not always get that information in the most timely manner. So we've been using uh, online data from the world's media, health forums and blogs, and a wide variety of other sources in 65 languages to monitor for early signals of outbreaks around the world um, and to process all that vast amount of data to present the metaphorical needles in the haystack to our subject matter experts. So we, we did that in the, on the morning of December 31st. And then our, our platform also connects, as you've highlighted, to the anonymous data on hundreds of millions of mobile devices and their locations as they move around the world, as well as billions of passenger level flight itineraries. And so this is really so we can start to get a step ahead and anticipate how an outbreak could rapidly spread across the planet. So that detection, Cameron, is the first step. But how does AA help with all the steps after that? Mm -hmm. Well, AI is ultimately really just a tool. So we've been using AI, as I mentioned, in expanding our ability for surveillance of infectious disease threats. In other instances, we've really been using things like network analysis, analysis of big data on, as I mentioned, travel data. Uh, but we're also increasingly using AI and ex experimenting and developing uh, tools to use AI to try and better predict where outbreaks might occur. Diseases spread around the world all the time. They don't all cause outbreaks, let alone pandemics. So these are active areas of research and development that we are engaged in. Uh, and this is something that, as you can imagine, every single microbe is different. Zika is different than Ebola, which is different than measles or COVID-19. So there's quite a bit of ongoing research and development that, um, that is needed. Mayor, you've been working on the front line with COVID-19 with patients. How do you see that AI could be used to help you in the future? So I think one of the biggest things we've found with the pandemic is the strain on um, staffing and resources. So the big promise of AI for the future in medicine is helping to take away some of that burden so that doctors and nurses and other clinicians can spend more time with the patients. So to give you an example, with the COVID patients, um, their lung failure means that we have to frequently adjust the settings on the ventilators. And there are algorithms that are being developed that would control that in a sort of closed loop manner, which meant that the staff don't have to be as involved. Do you think it could also help with health inequality around the world? Yeah, I think that's another big advantage. So in many countries where the ratio of doctors per head of the population is much lower, AI could have a big role in terms of access to healthcare and reducing inequalities. Tabitha, how quick is all the development around AI? Because it has been said that we've seen two years of development in just two months. Yes, that was Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft's quote, and, and we're hearing that reverberate around um, many other business leaders as well. Both everyone's really feeling like the 
the rush to um, the forced rush to get everybody online and connected has laid some really strong foundations for AI um, and those sort of technologies to actually thrive. And we're quite excited to see how um, the progress has meant that we we can see, as you've just heard before, within health, but also within was it within um, other areas like online learning, deliveries, uh, business as well. Give us some more examples of that about how it can be used beyond the field of medicine. So within um, online learning, I know that a lot of my friends have really benefited from support, support for the teachers and support for them in terms of using adaptive learning. So there's a company called Century Tech, for example, which provides the students with the best next question for them, depending on where they are in their journey. So that enables teachers to give them much more personalized support as they've gone through their day and their journey. Cameron, sell to us the potential of AI in the future. Well, clearly, there's uh, in in the field of medicine. You know, there's there's uh, as um, as uh, Dr. Nagendran had mentioned, there are many different applications. I mean, even things in assisting diagnosis. Um, you know, uh, with uh, analysis of medical imaging, there are many different potentials. I think, with respect to um, some of the work that we're doing at Blue Dot, is really to enhance our ability to monitor and track infectious disease threats in ways that um, perhaps is beyond the capacity of, of public health agencies, especially in resource limited environments, but also to anticipate their dispersions and what kind of consequences may occur um, ultimately so that we can be disseminating this type of knowledge faster than the diseases can spread, which we've learned with COVID-19 and many other outbreaks can happen very, very rapidly. Mayora, is there the possibility though that we could overhype all of this? I think that's something that we do have to consider. So obviously there's a lot of enthusiasm when it comes to AI and its potential in healthcare. But the, we do need to be careful of the hype. So headlines, for example, like AI can spot skin cancer before your doctor can make the public think that, you know, there's going to be in five, ten years time, there'll be no doctors and AI will have replaced everyone. Um, and that's obviously not likely to be the case. Do I think have... in terms of how we can improve uh, AI in healthcare going forward, one of the big factors is a more prospective testing and trials of some of these algorithms before they... Um, are adopted en masse. Um, and obviously that will depend on the extent to which it's involved in the in the um, in healthcare. So for example, an, an app on your phone that uses AI to monitor your sleeping habits doesn't need as high a burden of proof as something that might be suggesting potential treatments for you. Tabitha, what do you see as being the main limitations of AI? I think that it will become it will come down to um, safety um, and and trust really. Next week at COGX, we'll be looking at um, some of the challenges, but it's obvious that there has been no starker time to see the digital divide than the lockdown. Um, there is so much more that the techno community are going to need to do to ensure that we are respectfully serving everybody. I think that the biggest limitation is that if we aren't collecting data from vast sums of people, as you said, right as we introduced, we will be leaving people out of solutions. Um, and next week, we will have some incredible experts like Sophia Noble, who wrote Algorithms of Oppression, coming to talk to us about how do we ensure that we are not uh, increasing bias, racism, and, and uh, the, in making the digital divide even worse. Cameron, presumably it's not just those issues that are important, but also that collaboration is widespread, surely, not just mm -hmm. within companies and governments and organizations, but, you know, around the world globally. I think, uh, you know, this is a really important point. You know, what we need to do when we're responding to these types of threats is we need to turn data into insights, but then those insights have to ultimately be translated into actions. Um, you know, the perspective I take as a clinician who is practicing on the front lines is that we need to be empowering the whole of society. So typically what happens is the public health agencies may first become aware of a potential threat. Uh, and then that information gradually trickles down to the frontline healthcare workers, uh, industry, the public. Um, but sick patients don't end up uh, going to the public health department. They wind up, wind up in the hospital emergency department. And so we need to be thinking about ways that we can be translating these insights into actions and doing this in advance of the emergency, not in the middle of the crisis. And Tabitha, where would you say trust levels are at between the public and AI? And what needs to be done to make sure 
that, they're, that the public maintain a sense of, of trust in something like new technology? I think that um, we need to uh, walk the walk as well as talking the talk. Um, I think there's always more more work that can be done. We'll next week have the Open Data Institute and the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation talking about how the tech community can earn more trust in artificial intelligence. But it's really about getting the, 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 the story right and explaining why this technology can actually make people's lives better rather than just explaining the technology. Tap of the gold star. Mayora Negendran and Cameron Khan, a fascinating discussion. Thank you all very much for joining us, looking at artificial Thank intelligence and our life after lockdown series.